So I'm going to talk about uh, chapter four, which is the energy and health chapter. Um, but I was the convening lead author, but we had uh, a number of authors in a, uh, and representing in North America and Europe and Australia and uh, India. Um, one of those authors is in the room, Zoe Chaffee from UC Berkeley also. Um, now, I want to um, carefully frame this analysis uh, for you so that you can have some expectations about what I'm going to say. Um, it is not on the many important health benefits of access to clean energy. Um, those issues were covered in other chapters, but I'm going to be speaking on how energy systems actually affect the distribution of global health in major ways. So therefore, it is not on perhaps what you often see in a talk like this on the reverse issue, the ways relative health impacts perceived or measured relative health impacts of energy systems affect the distribution of energy systems. It's actually how energy systems affect the planet's health, the, global, the human health of the planet, which they do substantially. Um, secondary focus in our chapter, and I won't have much time to deal with it here, but is on um, how mitigating actions to mitigate climate change through the energy system will also, can also be directed in ways that directly benefit health, the so-called co-benefits framework. Um, so chapter four now focuses on attributable risks. How much of the current ill health in the world can be attributed to the, if you say, the mismanagement of energy systems? Um, the avoidable risk, how much of that can be reduced by changes in those energy systems were not directly part of chapter uh, four, but are found in chapter 17, the pathways chapter. You'll only hear more about that. Although, of course, I have, do have some opinions on those. Perhaps we can bring those up during the panel discussion. We use the environmental risk transition framework as a kind of organizing mechanism. Now, to remind you what that is, the idea behind the environmental risk transition is that there's a set of traditional environmental risks that operate at the household level. There associated with poverty in general, that tend to decline with economic development. And then there's a set of modern or some community level environmental risks that operate um, you know, in, at the community level, say urban development and that sort of thing, or uh, industrialization, that um, tend to rise first with economic development and plateau um, in middle income countries, so like India and China, and then decline in richer countries. And then finally, there's a third category, environmental risk, that tends to monotonically rise with um, economic development associated with global impacts, and most obvious one of those is climate change. So this is the framework, the sort of geographic framework, if you will, that we use to organize the chapter, but we elaborated it a bit further. Household, uh, for example, the use of biomass fuels for cooking. We actually put in workplace because the workplace environment is quite important in terms of global health impacts of energy systems, for example, coal mining. Community, we also talked about regional, the rise in uh, tropospheric ozone levels through the operation of energy systems in the world and the health impacts of that. And then, of course, uh, global. We also picked off some special topics that were thought to be of concern by the executive committee that don't really fit in this context, the energy efficiency of buildings, because improving energy efficiency, of course, is quite important for meeting climate change goals, but it also changes the building envelopes in ways that can be unhealthy. Um, the nuclear fuel cycle, um, but we focus in our chapter on the routine operation of the fuel cycle, uh, and, uh, releases from um, emissions from the fuel cycle, uh, nu uh, nuclear waste, and so forth. The accidental emissions, you know, from accidents were covered in chapter 14. And we also talked about some of the new emerging technologies like biofuels that might, uh, that look to be more and more important uh, as uh, energy systems change. So um, one of the concepts here that's important that uh, lies behind some of the results you'll see is sometimes the largest emissions of pollutants, for example, are not the ones that cause the largest health impacts. And the concept we use for that is the so-called um, intake fraction, which shows that now if you stick burning stuff in your mouth, active smoking, well, you get a thousand grams per ton, all of it goes down your throat. That's the worst possible thing you can do. 
But if you have somebody putting it in their mouth near you, near you, a lot of it can go down your throat too. So that, notice it's, um, these are log scales here. Um, and then a stove vented indoors, for example, as you would find in village houses, has a very large intake fraction. And a power plant um, has orders of magnitude less. So the takes, if you will, hundreds of more tons of pollution at a power plant to cause the same health effects as one ton in a household. So therefore, what seems to be a small source, like cooking fires, can actually have a very big health impact because, well, more people breathe more of it. Um, the bottom lines, if you're interested, is that poorly managed energy systems, currently responsible for a significant portion of the global burden of disease, 67, 6 to 7 premature, million premature deaths a year, approaching 10% of the entire burden of disease. That's a big number. And air pollution from incomplete combustion of fuels is the biggest source of that, but not the only source. All right, so this is the distribution of household use of solid fuels for cooking. It's, um, as you can see, essentially one-to-one -one with poverty in the world. Indeed, uh, I think you could hard to think of a better indicator of poverty. None of the t poorest two billion people in the world cook with gas, and none of the richest two billion, that's you and me, cook with open fires in our kitchens. It is almost one-to-one -one with poverty. Okay, so um, and this is a little hard to read. Let's just leave the rest one. The number of households that are cooking with solid fuels, that's coal and biomass basically, in the world, the fraction has been going down, but the number, the absolute number, has not been. It's been about 3 billion people, 2.8 billion people now for 30 years. So it's absolute things. If there's anything, the lesson from climate change is that we live on an absolute planet. And so we need to look at these absolute indicators. And the fact that there might be three people using clean fuels when, uh, um, for only, for the, if you're poor, there are now three times more, three people only using th uh, good fuels for, versus two using bad ones doesn't really help you much if you're still using bad fuels. And the absolute impact has not been improving, so that's not changing through economic development in terms of absolute impact. So one of the issues that uh, makes it difficult to do analysis here is the, the type of improvement you need is not linear. That is, if you change the, um, you know, to simple improved devices, for example, in, in households, uh, you don't get much benefit. This is the risk of one particular disease, child pneumonia. You really have to start getting clean down here, close to the WHO air quality guidelines before you see much improvement. So therefore, simple solutions um, of the type that have been promoted, for example, by major governments in the world in the past and by NGOs of a chimney or a slight change in the, in the combustion device are not going to achieve the health benefits that we need. They will not get at that four million premature deaths that Naki mentioned until you start getting very clean. So this involves either existing technology, which is mainly gas, LPG, liquefied petroleum gas is what uh, the rich use in the world, or electricity, or new technologies that now, now exist, actually, for burning biomass more cleanly. It's even more striking with another disease, this particular is heart disease. Notice the very sharp nonlinear relationship here. So if you're out here, you reduce the exposure by half, you don't hardly get any benefit at all. And this particular graph is in Formed by not only household air pollution data, but also secondhand tobacco smoke and outdoor air pollution data. So you really have to get clean before you get a benefit. And this has profound implications for what this access to modern fuels must be. And you know, if we play out these pathways forward. Now, outdoor air pollution also a significant part of the problem. Perhaps 80% of these particle air pollution around the world, this is from the chapter 17, is um, due to outdoor, uh, to energy systems, a little hard to say exactly. Um, and thus, as a result, these two things together are major impacts on the global burden of disease. Here is the uh, household air pollution from among all the risk factors examined. You can see that household air pollution is number four in terms of loss healthy life years in the world. Um, and uh, ambient particle air pollution is down here on the, on the list as well. A very large proportion of the burden of disease globally is from these two sources. By far bigger than any other environmental health risk. 
Um, well, here's household air pollution. Now, if you prefer premature deaths instead of uh, lost life years, high blood pressure is about 9 million, alcohol use about 8, tobacco about 6, household air pollution is about 3.5, but this secondhand smoke, we call it secondhand cooking smoke, that's the contribution to outdoor air pollution from households burning poor fuels, is also another half million. And here's outdoor air pollution. So these are the source of these very large numbers and they're up there with any other particular risk factor you want to choose as uh, being a source of ill health in the world. And of course dominated by um, rural households in developing countries. Um, in addition, as I mentioned, the household air pollution from solid fuels also contributes to some of this um, outdoor air pollution is from that. So if you actually add it to here, that's how you get the 4 million premature deaths from household air pollution is the combination of what happens in the household and downwind from the household. If you take premature deaths from energy, it's about 4 million from households. From other energy sources, about 2.2 million. Occupational impacts from energy systems, about 0.3 million. And currently, climate change, about 0.2 million. All that number is very uncertain. Um, I don't know if the Council General from India is still here. Uh, so I stuck this slide in at the last minute. But this is the impacts in India. And you can see that household air pollution is the chief cause of ill health for Indian women and girls. And still, third, just behind smoking for men in India. So in poor countries, of course, these, use, these poor fuel, uh, use of poor fuels or poor management of fuel combustion is even larger than it is on a global scale. So, um, significant impact on child health, perhaps 10 to 15 percent of child mortality, uh, important impact on adult health as well. Uh, now, incomplete combustion is uh, not good for you, as we've seen, but complete combustion is not so great either uh, because of the CO2 in fossil fuels. And of course, there are a range of uh, impacts from um, CO2, but uh, we focus on um, climate change. And um, the analyses that are done show that most of those impacts occur in already stressed populations, basically enhanced the background vulnerability. And about 80 percent, almost 90 percent of it occurs in third world children. So the first approximation, the health impacts of climate change are on third world children. Um, and of course, uh, CO2 is the most important, but there are a set of um, other uh, climate active pollutants that uh, come from incomplete combustion in general that lead to ozone creation, as shown here, or uh, lead to particle formation. Some of these are warming, some of these are cooling. The net impact on climate is quite difficult to determine with the aerosols, and I'm not going to get into it here, though there is quite a discussion in the chapter if you're interested. And here's two examples, and sulfur uh, black carbon emissions um, you know, are warming, and they, the energy sector is the major source of those emissions globally. But sulfur dioxide emissions uh, turn into sulfates, which are cooling. They are health damaging, but they are cooling. So consequently, the trade-off isn't exactly what you'd like. We're reducing sulfate emissions because of concerns of health and concerns of ecosystem protection, acid precipitation, but it, that has the effect of unmasking the warming signal in the world, so there's an unfortunate potential trade-off there between, well, a trade-off between health protection and climate protection. Um, I'm going to skip that. The co-benefits, um, as I mentioned, um, there are a range of co-benefits, um, things that we can do to mitigate climate change by reducing emissions that would have immediate health benefits in terms of reduction and exposure to air pollution, but also, uh, for example, in the building sector, the transport sector, and the residential sector, but also in reproductive health services, providing access to, uh, um, to um, contraception to many millions of, hundreds of millions of women in the world who want it, would reduce the trend of population growth, reduce energy use as a result, and reduce the impacts on the climate. Could be a 30% effect by the end of the century. Not any coercion, it's not population control, it's just providing access to women who already want it. Like every woman in this room has access to reproductive services to give that same access to all women. Um, in addition to management of the built environment, change the way cities are designed, operated mass transit, active, trans, uh, active you know, walking and this kind of thing, bicycling can have a major co-benefits. Um, the mitigation benefits are higher in developed countries, but the health benefits are greater in developing countries. 
Um, I'm going to skip that. Now, somebody talked about cost-effectiveness of this. We looked at this a little bit in the case of um, co-benefits. Here's a little complicated graph. But this is the health cost-effectiveness, dollars per dally, dollars per life year saved. And this is the carbon price uh, cost-effectiveness, dollars per ton of carbon. And in these particular analysis, you can see these particular uh, household uh, interventions for fuels are highly cost-effective. Anything less than a couple, two or three thousand dollars is well worth doing for help. Now, we used to think of $10 a ton as being cost-effective for carbon. I think the, climate, the carbon market is depressed now. But so these, compared to a few other things we took from the literature, look pretty cost-effective. So if there's some way of changing the financing or changing the way we think about the externalities of some of these interventions, it might be a way to get together the new resources needed in the future. I'm gonna, we also looked at um, climate change, and here's some estimates on the health impacts of climate change in 20, 2000 and the year 2030. There, you can see a large increase um, over this uh, projected over this time. The premature deaths, in terms of some of the other major impacts of, on health, are not high. But the problem is, of course, it's rising over time, and, and the question is where we're going. If I can make an aside, I, the one thing I think we should have done better in this chapter, and perhaps the GEA overall, is to look at the extreme climate futures out there. If we don't do more mitigation, those extreme climate futures, the six degree and nine degree worlds that are lower probability, but not low probability, um, would have very large impacts not only on health but other systems. Here's an uh, analysis of the equity aspects of climate change and health. These are the, the this graph here is the, um, the lost life years per capita um, across the development spectrum here measured in purchasing power. And then you can see this curve as the richer countries have less impact because they start in a less vulnerable place. They have the same climate, you know, same atmosphere, but they are less vulnerable to any changes. And so it's um, on this on this hand, on this curve here is the imposition, who is actually emitting the pollution and the, the responsibility of the, for the total health impacts in the world distributed by who's emitting it. And of course that goes the other way. And the ratio here is, you know, about 300 to 1. That is, in the richer countries we are imposing 300 times more risk than we're receiving in terms of climate change, um, part of the equity or inequity issue in the world. We looked at life cycle issues in terms of um, new merging technologies and you know, the classic sort of life cycle, this one for biofuels. There's a discussion of the potential impacts on health at various stages of biofuel production that you'll find in the graph. We also looked at the nuclear fuel chain or various nuclear fuel chains, um, uh, the different types of nuclear power systems. Basically for routine operation they are very small health risk in the world. The, imp the concern with nuclear power of course is in the non-routine operations, reactor accidents and um, terrorist events perhaps. Um, so, biomass and coal, lack of clean fuels and good combustion, outdoor air pollution. Not just urban, there's a lot of outdoor air pollution in rural areas or intra-urban areas as well from energy systems. Occupational impacts from solid fuel use, climate change, these are the main ones. Now I'm going to end with two slides from, the, I think, the first chapter of GA. Um, here is the world primary energy shares, you know, starting in 1850, going to the present, and you can see how biomass looks like it's becoming less and less important. And um, coal came up and it was peaked around, um, what was it, 1910 or so, and then it's going down. It makes it look like, when you look at it on a share basis, as if these fuels are sort of um, fixing themselves in a way. But this, again, remember what I said about absolute. It's really the absolute we're concerned about, isn't it? A kilogram of coal is not burned on an absolute planet. What about the absolute kilograms of coal or the absolute kilograms of biomass? In fact, they've never gone down. We've used the same, lot, the same amount of biomass for fuel for millennia, and we still do today. We use, we never use less coal one year than the next, except minor things with wars and stuff. We're using more and more coal, more and, if anything, more biomass than we used to. Maybe it's cleaner, maybe not. But these solid fuels are still a major part of the energy picture, and they're certainly the major part of the health side of the energy picture. For the future, um, you know, we see most of the impact of poor combustion management now, but over time, 
if we if the GEA type of pathways are followed, well, that'll be, that'll we'll squeeze that out. But unless we do something about climate change, the climate change health impacts, which are a relatively small part of the picture now, will rise. And the fraction of climate change from energy system, which is roughly 65 percent now, because we have you know deforestation and other con contributions, will rise over time. So energy becomes more and more important in the climate sector over time. So just to end with, we uh, the GEA chapter is of course a huge thing, um, and um, we published um, sort of a synthesis of it in a major journal in our field. Um, just this it just came out a month ago or so, with a slightly different set of authors, maybe a bit more accessible if you have an interest in this area. Thank you very much.